Good afternoon. My name is Jeff Goldstein from the Goldstein Law Firm. We've gathered some of the smartest and best litigators in the country for a short panel this afternoon. What I'd like to do is ask everybody to introduce themselves briefly, starting with Bethany Appleby. Bethany Appleby, Appleby and Corcoran in Connecticut, representing franchisors and also franchisees in transactional matters. And I have in-house and law firm experience uh, in franchise law for almost 25 years now. Great. Ben? Thanks, Jeff. Hi, I'm Ben Reed. I'm a partner at Plave Cook and based in Reston, Virginia. Uh, we represent solely franchisors and the, my primary practice is representing franchisors in disputes. Great. Mark? Hi, my name is Mark Leitner. I'm from Laffey, Leitner & Good in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I have been uh, a commercial trial lawyer for 36 years, and uh, we do work for both franchisees and franchisors, focusing on litigation, but occasionally uh, counseling uh, before contracts are made. Thank you. Alan? I'm Alan Hillman from the firm of Garcia and Milas in New Haven. Uh, on December 6th, I will have been a lawyer for 50 years, uh, and I've represented both sides for many years, first in Maryland for many years, and then I moved to Connecticut for love in 2006. Uh, and uh, I represent both sides, as I said, depending on who has the moral high ground. Thank you. What we're going to do on this panel is probably a little unique. Uh, it's not intended to be a tutorial. It's just to get a feel for how really good litigators are viewing some of the issues that uh, come up in the franchise world frequently. And uh, I'm going to move people along. And I don't mean to be rude. Uh, I will try not to cut people off. But everybody we've met once and we've discussed the uh, the process, and we've had some objections, but everybody signed on in the end, including Alan. All right, question one, and we're gonna start with Bethany. Would you prefer to be in arbitration or court if you were representing a franchisee? If I were representing a franchisee, um, probably in arbitration uh, because it, the lack of dispositive motions uh, could be helpful and uh, evidentiary issues could be a little simpler, a little less expensive. Those would be a couple of the reasons that I think if I were, were representing a franchisee, I might choose arbitration. Thanks. Ben? Um, well, if I was representing a franchisee, I'd probably have lost my job. So I'm not really sure where I'd prefer to be. <laughs> um, I, I think I agree with Bethany. If I'm a franchisee, I'd rather be uh, before an arbitrator. Uh, in my experience, you know, you get, you get an arbitrator who sometimes will want to uh, take the approach of making both sides happy. Uh, and that can lead to a better result sometimes for a franchisee than, than a court might who's just going to straight read the contract and potentially the contracts can be less favorable to the franchisee. Thanks. Mark? I would probably rather be in court because it's been my experience, lawyers being who they are, uh, arbitration sometimes can be faster and simpler, but lawyers almost always loaded up with all of the procedural slowdowns and mechanisms that uh, make court litigation slower. And uh, if an arbitrator makes a mistake, you can't do anything to fix it. Thanks. Alan? Uh, I agree, if that's possible. Uh, uh, I, I tend to think I would be in arbitration for a franchisee, but I hear Mark. And uh, my general view is, frankly, if I'm right in a case, clearly, I'd love to be in federal court. Um, but uh, in general, for a franchisee, I think arbitration. Thank you. Uh, my, my view on this is, since I represent only franchisees, I, I would say I'd always want to be in front of an arbitrator with one major caveat and including all the reasons you guys have given. Uh, the as franchise agreements have gotten more complex over time, uh, the enforcement by a court is, in my opinion, is, is going to be uh, balanced against a franchisee. And the cost is another issue, as as was said. But my main issue and I have 
I'm bringing this to the fore in a, a two cases I have now is the panel that's chosen uh, in your arbitration cases comes from a local jurisdiction. And that panel is lawyers that have some connection with that area. And if you have a forum selection clause in a like choice or subway, that person, that lawyer is going to be on the potential panels over and over. And because the party has an ability to strike or rank arbitrators, I think it's an inherent conflict that doesn't need to be there. Uh, you know, Jeff, I, I hadn't thought of that, although I've, I've confronted that on a number of occasions. I'm in Connecticut where there are just two or three major franchisors. And I think your point is extremely well taken, not because I doubt the ethics of anybody, but because every panel that I see has people who have done 10 and 20 different arbitrations involving a given franchisor. And it's realistic to assume that this person knows that if she rules against the franchisor, at a minimum, the franchisor is going to be disinclined to pick that person, is going to strike that person in the future. Um, that's just human nature. So I think that's uh, that's a very well taken point. Bethany, did you have something you wanted to add? I did, not on that same point, but you know, um, one of the assumptions that I think we all built into the uh, question was that this was a single franchisee uh, with an individual case. And if I were representing a, fran a franchisee who perhaps wanted to join a class or have a you know a, some sort of consolidated or group claim, then I would probably uh, prefer to be have the ability to go to court. Thank you. Issue two: Do franchise disclosure documents provide a significant benefit to franchisees? Why or why not? Ben, I think they do. Uh, I think they provide uh, information that's meaningful. I mean, the FTC uh, instituted the, the franchise rule in 1979 for that very reason, that they wanted a flow of information to come to franchisees. Um, you know, I think I think the cumbersome part of it all is that it's a large document. And so, you know, it's incumbent upon uh, franchisees to seek out legal counsel to help them navigate that document so they can understand what's important. Um, I think the most critical part of the franchise disclosure document, from my point of view, uh, as, as representing franchisors is the list of franchisees in the system. Um, I think that's an invaluable resource to franch potential prospective franchisees that they can go and contact franchisees in the system and franchisees who actually left the system to see what the franchisor is really about. Thanks. Bethany? I, I sort of agree with Ben in that uh, I think it has value, but it most of its value is when the franchisee is well advised either by its business advisors or um, uh, legal advisors to explain what it means. And, you know, it it's doesn't necessarily, a franchisee isn't necessarily going to know to contact the former and current franchisees unless somebody recommends that. So the tools are there, but I think it, it really uh, um, has value when the franchisee has some sort of guidance to go along with it. Thanks. Mark? I'm going to uh, uh, make it uh, three in a row for the same uh, general answer. Uh, people make people who are pointed toward that information in the FDD uh, almost invariably do make good use of it. The problem is in getting them to uh, to see what is there, to know what is there, and then to take the steps they need. Uh, and that usually doesn't happen without a nudge from someone. Because remember, the franchisee, the prospective franchisee, is at this point, uh, they're raring to do a deal. They see an opportunity, they have had their appetite whetted, and they want to sign. And uh, somebody uh, needs to stand at third base and put up the hold up a little bit signal. Thanks. Al? I agree with all that. And uh, I think that it's pretty obvious that that a prospective franchisee needs some guidance. Uh, those people are not lawyers. Um, let me add, first of all, I think item seven itself, where you talk about your investment, even though there are broad ranges, is extremely important. Um, you know, the rationale for having this, we all know, is is, is the problems that existed before California began the, the trend to have laws. Uh, they're very valuable. The other thing is, uh, you know, when I counsel franchisees, they have no idea what the franchise agreement itself really means uh, you know it's it's many pages 
you know, there are obviously some words that mean a whole lot and, and to, to us that don't to them. And sometimes people will say to me, well, is all this, can they enforce all this? And as an old antitrust lawyer, I say to them, well, when I started, there were a lot of stuff in there they couldn't. But right now, I haven't seen a franchise agreement in years where there was anything that was illegal. So you ought to understand that you're going to have to live up to what you see in there. So let's talk about what is in there. Thanks. Um, I think I'm going to probably be the only dissenter on this one. I, I think at this point in the evolution of FDDs, they're relatively useless. If a franchisee does not have somebody who's competent to a system, as everybody pointed out, uh, it's an absolutely useless document. They'll never get through it, nor will they understand it. Um, I don't believe without profit disclosures that it's valuable. And I think one of the biggest inherent defects to the FDD is that you cannot compare one to the other. And these franchisees go into this with a very myopic view. They pick something before they've even gotten to somebody to help them. And so I think that uh, a data bank might help. I think the FDD has to be shorter, crisper. And uh, I think it's really uh, a mechanism that uh, franchisors uh, use uh, for their own benefit on, on balance. Um, okay, let's go to question number three. Uh, can I just say one thing? Of uh, course. Uh, quickly, I think that your objections are simply a matter of, and I don't deny some of them. Right. Uh, you're exalting the perfect over the good, to use Voltaire. Um, in other words, they aren't perfect, but I think without them, franchisees would be in worse shape. Well, I, I, that's a good point. But, I, but I, what I was saying was it, it would have to be shorter in order for that, for it to be, I, I think, to be valid. I think people given the size, don't look at it at all. So I think some information is good. I think there are a lot of cognitive defects that have been shown by economists over the last 10 years. And speaking with franchisees, they, even after I go through the entire uh, agreement, they have little uh, knowledge. But you're, you're right, Alan. If you push me, I would say, would I rather have it or not have it? I'd rather have it, but I think it's incredibly defective. And... Um, I know I was going to run through these uh, as quick as uh, as possible, but I did want to address uh, Ben's point quickly uh, that there's a list of franchisees. Um, that's a really great point, and it, it, it's the party line. And I don't take anything away from, and I say that with all due respect to Ben. That's one of the weakest aspects of, of the process is that a franchisee trying to call people, the people who are going to have the most information are usually restricted due to confidentiality orders or they're scared to say what's going on because it'll go straight back to the franchise or so in theory it's a beautiful theory we put all these people's names in it but i'd say it's it's useful and i have, I have a pretty good sample set maybe five percent of the time but um you know ben's is perfectly legitimate uh position um all right question three why is it that we still see today exclusive territory cases actively litigated? Now you can twist this, the question a little bit because I'm not perfectly clear as you guys pointed out during our last call. So who wants to take this one first? Alan, you've been going last all the time. It's fine. Can you repeat the question? Sure, sure. Why is it that we still see today exclusive territory cases actively litigated exclusive territories actively actively litigated in court still oh i see okay yeah well i think that one of the reasons is if you go back to the 19 uh the 1990s uh and uh famous case in california um we had issues concerning the definition of of the territory, what rights the franchisee actually had, not just vis-a-vis -vis other franchisees, but vis-a-vis -vis the franchisor, uh, which is one of the reasons you have these long, long carve-outs for franchisors, you know, notwithstanding that you have this particular right, you know, we can do this, 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 and this. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons that, that these are litigated. Another thing is that uh, some of the states, Maryland for one, 
uh, and FDDs will is very exacting about what you mean by exclusive and whether it's exclusive. And you may think it's exclusive, but it's not. But I think largely it's because franchisees don't want competition from other franchisees and they want to know what their rights are. Uh, I'm really not sure how often that particular point is litigated, but I'll yield to my colleagues on that point. Right. Mark? Um, I, I want, I, I'm going to agree with Alan. I think a lot of it comes from uh, franchisees who don't understand their what's in the agreements. And if they did read the agreement, don't necessarily believe that uh, it's going to be enforced against them. Uh, and then uh, they see a franchisor exercising its right to uh, uh, operate uh, company-owned stores or to uh, to use one of the other mechanisms, and they get uh, they get uh, exercised about it, and they start lawsuits. Uh, some of which they they can win, notwithstanding the language, and some they lose. But I think it's really a uh, a case of uh, expectations being uh, not being met. Thank you, Ben. I Oh, I'm, yeah, I'm going to take a little bit of a different route on this. I think right. to me, the uh, encroachment cases are rising more now because franchisors often have made the, if they grant exclusivity, have made that territory very small. And despite that fact, I think a lot of franchisors actually have the franchisee's best interests at heart and they've developed these economic impact plans. And so when you develop that plan, and then you implement it as part of your system, it kind of grafts itself onto the, the contractual relationship on some level. And that's where we've seen these claims arising, the El Pollo Loco case, the KFC case, those all related to economic impact analysis uh, claims, where I think if you look at the agreement, uh, the agreement would have just reading it straight would have allowed the, the development to happen. But when you when you graph that uh, economic analysis on top of it, it, it adds a factual dispute that, that results in a, a claim that can go for the franchisee. Good point. Bethany? Yeah, I've seen that as well as sort of one of those no good deed goes unpunished uh, problems. Uh, but I also still see um, ambiguity in drafting. So just drafting errors, lack of clarity. And so then, you know, instead of uh, settling or dispositive motion, the parties do have to fight over it. And then also um, older contracts pose problems because they haven't necessarily foreseen some of the ways that, um, you know, Brands can go into grocery stores or uh, into cyberspace and, and all of the other uh, delivery, you know, all kinds of uh, things that hadn't been contemplated. So those are until those old agreements are all gone, we're still going to continue grappling with those problems, I think. Exactly. I, I'd add one more point. I think somebody may have touched on it. The way I look at this is that everybody has an intuitive concept of what is an exclusive territory, as though the word is magic. It gives you some protection against intra-brand competition. However, they see that, and then that's three sentences. Then you go to the next two pages of reservation of rights to the franchise or what the franchise or can do. He can do internet. He can do DoorDash across the place. He can, he can do wholesaling. He can do national. And every piece of what people would think intuitively is an exclusive territory is taken, taken apart and taken back methodically and uh and uh the expectations when something like that happens you know what's a franchisee guy gonna do he's gonna try and engraft a covenant of good faith and fair dealing which is not a, a good way to go uh i guess if you have nothing else but the the point is that it's the language in the contract and i think it's become more and more oppressive from my view uh over time with the reservation of rights um number Issue number four, what do you view to be the most significant regulatory failure in the franchise industry at this time? Ben? Ooh. No, don't pick me first on this one. All right. I'll, I'll do it. All right, Bethany. I, and I don't know if you can call it a regulatory failure. Maybe it's just more of a regulatory scheme failure is just yeah. uh, the lack of consistency and the lack of uniformity. Um, and I suppose also, you know, delays in, you know, if the franchisor does everything right in a perfect world, in a registration states, it should be able to go ahead and franchise. And sometimes there are um, delays or lack of clarity on what's required from the franchisor to get registered. Um, 
And so I guess those, I, I, again, I don't, failure, I think is, is an unfair word, but I okay. think things that, opportunities for potential improvement, perhaps. That's a good point. Mark? From, from my perspective, and you, you can remember that I, uh, I grew up in Wisconsin under the Wisconsin Fair Dealership Law, and to my mind, the, uh, the biggest gap is created by the lack of, a, uh, of laws like that in every state, or probably more realistically, a national law that would uh, prohibit against uh, uh, termination of franchises without good cause or non-renewal without good cause. Good point. Alan? I want to jump on Mark's point, uh, I think, and Bethany really too, uh, uniformity. Uh, I've thought for a very long time since uh, there were proposals in Congress uh, to have a uniform franchise law. I, I think that the, the termination issue is maybe less important because of uh, there's there are a fair number of laws and the contracts themselves, you know, are pretty good when it comes to, you know, good cause. Uh, obviously, there are a lot of a lot of ways the franchise or can find good cause. But I think that the, the regulatory scheme on, on disclosure, we really ought to have a uniform law. We should have a federal law. I realize we're not going to have a federal law, uh, you know, in, in our lifetime. Uh, well, maybe mine. But I think. Uh, it would be a great benefit uh, for all the reasons that we've heard. All right. Uh, ben, did we hit you? I passed, I but I mean, I, I, oh, I, that's cool. All right. Here's a short, those were longer questions. Here's a short question. When Russian franchisees start suing the franchisors for leaving Russia, would you like to be the franchisees or the franchisor's lawyer? Just short answer, franchisees or franchisor's lawyer. Bethany? I'm not sure I'd want to represent a Russian franchisee. I'm, I, 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 I'm still going to go franchisor. Is that just because of the nationality? Let, let me ask you No, this. no, no. I, I'm saying like, you know, just logistically, like... Anyway, I uh, well, let me ask you this. Who do you think would have the better claim? Let me ask it like that. Franchisee or the franchisor? I, I'm going to pull a, a Ben and pass on this one. All I right. Think. Ben? Ben gets, ben gets to go on this one. I, mean, <laughs> I represent franchisor, so I'm going to have to say the franchisor. Well, who do you think would have a better case? The franchisor. What? Franchisor? Well, here's what I think that'll move. I, I, what I was thinking was if the franchisors have left, right? And the franchisee is left sitting there. He's going to have a claim that the franchisor just stopped supporting it. And then the franchisor is going to say, well, wait a minute, we had the war. So then you've got a force majeure where the franchisees are usually fighting to, to assert it. Now you've got the franchisor. But I think it was foreseeable that Putin was going to be a nut in doing something like that. So if foreseeable, so I would take the franchisee case. Mark, what do you think? Well, I think that you can the 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 Putin angle can cut both ways because uh, if Putin's going to do something crazy, you might want to not invest in a franchise uh, or or bring your system into Russia. Uh, right. it, it could be an you know in pari delicto situation uh, where nobody did anything wrong, but uh, but n nobody took account of uh, of of uh, you know international. Uh, 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 violent political developments. Okay. Alan? If it were a matter of the franchisor not being able to obtain supplies, etc., from abroad that it needs, I'd say that the franchisor is the better case. If not, it's not really a force majeure from the franchisor perspective because the franchisor is, Russia has not been attacked. Uh, and the franchisor can continue working in Russia. It's a philosophical matter. And I don't think that's uh, an out in contract. All right. Thank you. Question number five. This goes to what we were sort of getting into, and I think Mark mentioned uh, a minute ago. Uh, currently, there are, I think, 18 franchise relationship states that have franchise relationship laws. And the question is, do we need a uniform federal relationship law? Uh, Mark? I'm all for it. 
I am all for it. I think not only as, as people mentioned earlier, uh, with respect to termination and non-renewal, but with respect to Wisconsin's prohibition on uh, changes in competitive circumstances. Uh, and we've been able to do some good things for our clients uh, in this state using that provision. And uh, again, I think it leads to a fairer and uh, more even-handed and beneficial relationship with uh, franchising in Wisconsin uh, is thriving. Alan? Well, I'm an old liberal, so I do favor every conceivable regulation. Um, uh, I think that I would like to see that uh, in that sense. I agree with Mark, uh, <laughs> consistent with what I said before. I said I'm not sure we need that as much as a, a, a disclosure law that would be uniform. Um, uh, I think it, I'm not sure how far they should go. It really, when you talk about a lot of the things besides good cause for termination and non-renewal, you're getting into a lot of issues which lead to a whole lot of litigation and business judgment issues. Uh, I'd like to hear what Ben has to say and Bethany has to say about that point. All right, Ben. I, I don't I don't favor it. Uh, I, I like the idea of there being uh, the states having control over how they want to define contractual relationships uh, with parties in their states. Uh, I think an overlay of federal law uh, doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, there's no federal UCC. Why should we have federal relationship laws that, that we graft over the top of the party's ability to, to negotiate a contract? Do you, do you think that's uh, that the circumstances of franchisees in different states are significantly different that you could justify keeping it local as as a good argument for that? I, I don't know that it's about the franchisee situation. I think it's it's more of a federalism uh, question. And I, I, I think in those situations, um, states should be have the authority over the contractual relationships that are entered into by citizens of their states. OK, you're, you're not saying any, anything about a Commerce Clause issue. I mean, you'd recognize we have industry specific national. Mm -hmm. you, you're you're just saying as a matter of preference, right? I mean, I'm not a big fan of, of the PMPA. I mean, I, I you know, I'd, I'd rather it be a state law issue, but that's I mean, I don't get to make that decision. Right. I'm not Congress. Right. Bethany. I think the devil you know, is in the details. But if you're a na national franchise or you're tripping over these relationship statutes all the time. And if you're in house trying to keep track and they, you know, the state laws change all the time in how many days you need to give, when you need to cure, you know, renewal rights, all sorts of things. So, you know, I, if it were a basic law that, and it also preempted the state laws, so it would take away the problem of having to worry about California versus Wisconsin versus whatever. Um, I, I could I could see that simplifying franchisors' lives in their day-to-day -day, um, relationships with uh, franchisees. They could have one uniform sort of. They wouldn't have to worry so much about drafting around it and putting in all those to the extent permitted by law language and and having conflicting uh, cure periods. So if it didn't go too far, I, I'm I'm not sure I'm against it. Even though I do tend to represent franchisors. Now, when you say if it didn't go too far, I I, I, I think at the end, you, you may have uh, thought that I was going to ask you this next question, but uh, uh, I, I, I won't. So let's go to um, remodels. This is a short answer question. Okay. Should there be a maximum limit on the number of remodels a franchisee is required to do every five years? And if your answer is yes, how many? Bethany? Do you, I, I guess it, I mean, from, from the franchise, oh, okay. Um, a limit on the number of times or how much it costs or what the ROI is. I, I guess I'm not sure what you mean by okay, limit. I, I, you're right, but I, I asked it in terms of limit some type of limit, but I said a limit on the number of remodels. Significant remodels. Should there I, be a limit? Um, I think there should be a reasonable limit. I just don't know how you would decide because that may be different for different 
industries and you know talking about different price points but i i i don't think it's unreasonable to uh to have some sort of limit but usually there is a contractual limit of five years or seven years or whatever as well all right alan i agree there should be a, a limit like like bethany states and i've seen that uh i think that it, it's logical to have a dollar limit rational uh you know and again it's going to vary from system to system but I don't think it's correct to, you know, to have an unlimited obligation from by the franchisee to remodel. I, mean, I wouldn't say, you know, you've got to do it every five years and you could spend a hundred thousand dollars. I mean, it, you know, to pull a lot of people out of business. So I mean, ten, twenty, thirty thousand, whatever would be appropriate. But I think there ought to be a, a limit, but not a federal law or not a state law. I think there should be a limit. Uh, you know, I think franchisors should have limits. Okay, Mark. Uh, I agree with that. Uh, you know, people uh, tend to, if, if people can impose uh, costs, uh, uh, business costs on other parties, uh, they'll tend to do it. And uh, that that leads to bad decision making. If a franchisor doesn't have uh, skin in the game in, in the form of uh, having to put its own money behind changes, it's probably going to order too many changes. Ben? Yeah, I mean, I think as a practical matter, there definitely should be a limit um, because, you know, at some point you're cutting off your nose to spite your face. If you're making your franchisees spend money every, you know, two years to do a remodel, they're not going to be able to have the capital to, to run the business the way that you want them to run it. So, I mean, I think practically speaking, a franchisor that is just going to do willy nilly remodels is, is, is destroying their system, whether that requires some kind of contractual limit. I could go either way on that. I mean, in some cases, you're going to have systems get bought and sold. You know, new ownership comes in. They want to change and refresh. I and mean, that happens. But in those cases, I, I think those systems are smart to do incentivized development where they give, you know, royalty relief for some period of time for franchisees who step up and do the remodel. So you would be in favor of, of contract language that uh, did not uh, reserve uh, the remodeling decision to the sole discretion of the franchisor. Is that right? I don't know that I would go that far. I just, I, I, I think, I, I just, to me, it's a, it's a problem that, that I don't see very often. I don't see franchisors going in and do, requiring remodels every two years. It's just not something that, that, that clients usually do. I think they have a recognition understanding that that's not something they can hamstring their, their franchisees with. So I don't know that I see the need for, for contractual language that restricts it one way or the other. Okay. The answer is yes, there should be limit every five years and the number is one. Next issue. Let's go to the, uh, I was going to, we're, we're going so uh, fast that it feels like we're not hitting all the questions. Um, opportunism. Who is more opportunistic and why? The franchisees or franchisors? Who wants to go first on this? And this was disclosed question. I'll go first. Okay. All right. Yeah. I'll go first. I, you know, again, I grew up in the Seventh Circuit, and and the Seventh Circuit teaches us all about opportunistic behavior, and uh, and the whole idea of uh, a law like the Wisconsin Fair Dealership Law is that uh, a franchisor will uh, get the benefit of investment and work on the part of the franchisee and then change the terms of the deal to uh to favor itself at the franchisee's expense and uh and that affects the way that the negotiation and the bargaining happens and i think that's i think that's accurate i think judge posner and judge easterbrook were onto something uh when they came up with that justification for the for uh, uh, protectionist laws, and uh, and I think that is a valid and uh, empirically based justification for it. Thank you, Alan. The, I was going to say to Mark, what does Judge Posner think? Uh, and if you're talking about Posner, who's of course an, an icon, and Easterbrook, who's very smart, and both conservatives, uh, I'm convinced by that sort of argument that. Uh, maybe the franchisor is more opportunistic. Opportunistic, of course, sounds pejorative. Uh, maybe it was meant to sound pejorative. I mean, it, it, one thing I've learned is that there are plenty of good franchisors out there. There are plenty of good franchisees. Um, I started off 
thinking there were only good franchisees. And I've learned that's not the case. And it is, it isn't a legal partnership, but it very much is a partnership. And, you know, if, if one does well, the other does well. So uh, I don't feel strongly about this particular issue. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I kind of tell off of what Alan said. I, I think you, it's hard to generalize whether one is more opportunistic than the other. I think you have situations where you have franchisees that can be opportunistic and take advantage of, a, of, of an emerging franchise, or you have situations where franchisors will take advantage of a franchisee. I mean, you've got the Burger IM situation. I mean, there, I think it goes both ways. And, and generalizing that one is more opportunistic than the other, I mean, obviously you can't you can't do an economic analysis of that, but it's it's human nature on some level. And I think it, it, it just gets down to the, the, the individuals you're dealing with. Thanks. Bethany? Yeah, I think that's right. I agree with Ben, because I've certainly seen opportunistic franchisees in, in wearing my litigation hat. So. Right. I think I would uh, take a more theoretical view on this in that I agree with everybody that both sides are opportunistic naturally. But I think the laws in place in the franchise agreements already cover the franchisee's opportunism. You have audits. You can see when they're cheating. You can see when they're undercutting. Uh, so, And you have termination rights to, to discipline when the opportunistic behavior uh, occurs. Now, even in your uh, economics, the very few economics books on, on franchising, there's only a small paragraph on opportunism by franchisors. And I, I think there's a, a great uh, number of instances where, where opportunism does strike franchisors. And because the franchise agreements uh, do not necessarily uh, have equivalents to termination rights against the franchisor and investigation rights, where are those ad funds being spent? There's no way for the franchisee to detect and discipline opportunism, which everybody is, agrees is on both sides. So I'd say it's more with the franchisor only because there's no mechanisms uh, that are in place that, that actually discipline them. Um, okay. Issue number nine. Are liquidated damages really legitimate in a franchise context? Bethany. I think so. And I, you know, I th also think that um, having liquidated damages where, you know, going into it, it's spelled out what the obligation is, I think can be helpful because I've certainly been in other situations litigating, you know, lost uh, franchise or lost profits and, you know, neither it, it gets contentious and the franchisee can be very surprised by the fact that that's a thing if it's not spelled out in the clearly in the contract. So I think it's good for both parties to see it. They know what it is, and I don't have a problem with it. Thank you. Ben? Yeah, I agree with Bethany. I, I, I think liquidated damages provisions are uh, very helpful to the parties to define the relationship if it's going to come to an end. I know in a lot of um, hospitality franchise agreements, it, it's, a, it's a benefit to the franchisee. They know what they have to pay to get out of the agreement, and that, that they like that. They like knowing, I, if I pay you this, we're good. I'm done. I can convert to a different brand now. Um, so I think I think they do have some advantages over litigating lost profits. All right, Mark. Uh, it you know I'm going to give the classic lawyer dodge answer. It depends because there are an awful lot of situations uh, where in in my experience they have uh, practically operated as a penalty, and uh, sometimes we've even been able to knock them out on those grounds. So. I, uh, I think that there are times when they may be appropriate. Certainly, as Ben points out in the hospitality industry, it is a well-known, you know, the windows open up and uh, every five years and you can uh, write your check and, and get out. Uh, but in, uh, in other uh, areas of industry, it's much less uh, clear cut and, uh, and I think much more burdensome. Thank you. Al? I agree. Uh, one thing that has occurred to me uh, from my days representing terminated franchisees and their effort to uh, you know, use expert testimony, et cetera, to project their own lost profits and so forth, there isn't the, the question becomes, why couldn't there be liquidated damages for a terminated franchisee who was terminated, was found to have been terminated in violation of the contract? 
you know, X number of years of, you know, gross net profits over so-and-so. I mean, it's not as easy to do that as to have X years of royalties, you know, from the past as in the hospitality industry, for instance, uniformly. Uh, one issue, another issue, I, I, I happen to have a case right now in the hospitality industry in a hotel. And uh, uh, there's a reservation, the, what the liquidated damages says that uh, uh, it doesn't exclude the franchisor's right to seek specific performance, uh, which is interesting. I doubt very much that a court will grant specific performance when you've chosen liquidated damages. But, you know, it's an interesting thing theoretical point anyway yeah it is well let me let me just follow up for a second on this what if you have a franchisee you guys brought up the hotel and if it's a 10-year term and the guy is in his ninth year and uh something happens he wants to get out uh and uh he's got to pay three years worth of damages of liquidated damages do you think that's fair or if it, even if it is fair, it doesn't matter. Ben? That's not how I've usually seen them drafted, Jeff. I, I mean, you, normally they, they're drafted to be three years or the, the remaining term of the contract, whichever is less. So, um, you know, in, in that situation, it'd be one year worth of, of liquidated damage as opposed to three. And that, that seems to me to be a fair price to pay to get out. What, what yeah, I think you'd have a good argument that that was a penalty and not uh, liquidated mm -hmm. damages if you go beyond the contractual term. Yeah. I had one other question. I was thinking about this today. Everybody looks whether it was fair at the time. And once these things are determined by a court, good luck going back in and trying to relitigate, you know, a choice or a send in whatever they, they've got the, the numbers. Um, but uh, I, I, I think that there's no inability to show what the lost profits are. I, I think that's something that should have been part of the genesis of here's why we needed a liquidated damages provision. And this, we, it's gonna be hard to prove. It's really not that hard to prove in a franchise, right? You got the, you got the uh, advertising fees, you got the fees. So I, I think th that um, the court has been put before the horse years and years ago. And I, I don't think that's an issue that's really addressed now. I, if you're representing only franchisees, I think these clauses, uh, you know, with respect to Ben on this, I think uh, most franchisees would prefer not to have a liquidated damage. But I can see situations where it is. If you're able to negotiate it down to 75 grand before you sign the agreement, it's great for the franchisee. Well, and Jeff, it's also great potentially for a franchisee who gets terminated in 2022 for the look back of two years when we've been in a pandemic and the revenues have been much lower, the liquidated damages might be a lot smaller and then the franchise or stuck with it. So it, it, I, it, it can go both ways, I guess. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, all right, let's move to our next issue. Um, see how much time is I had to pick out my favorite questions. I like this question. All right, number 11. Is it legitimate that system standards manuals are incorporated by reference into franchise agreements, which franchisees cannot read until after they buy the franchise? Alan. Well, when I first got into this a million years ago, I said to myself, wait a minute, we're signing a contract and, and there's an 80 page document we're not even allowed to see till we sign it. Uh, and then I said, oh, well, you know, it says this is confidential. That's confidential. Uh, there's not a lot that's confidential in these manuals. Um, and on the other hand, there are certain things. Um, I, I would like the idea that, you know, that that the manual in general would be available to the extent reasonable in terms of what needs to be protected. Uh, you know, I just, I don't, it's, it's not a bright line here is the problem. And I can appreciate why, you know, the bright line that's chosen is you just get to see the very informative table of contents. Right. Um, well, I, I think what's worse, and for, for the other panel members, I think what's worse in addition to the disclosure issue is that a lot of courts incorporated fully in an enforcement proceeding 
And that 80 pages becomes the gospel as though it is printed in the franchise agreement. So now your 80 page franchise agreement is now 150. And, and they're enforced almost the same way by many courts. Uh, that's been my experience uh, from time to time. But Mark, what do you, what do you think on? Well, I'm, I'm going to bring out my uh, Wisconsin Fair Dealership Law again, and I think it's uh, there has to be a filter of some kind because you can't enforce, you know, uh, and 80 pages is is small. Uh, you know, an operations manual is going to run longer than that, and to treat each and every provision of that operations manual as a contractual obligation equal to everything else. Uh, it makes no sense, and it's not how anybody runs their business. And uh, the the WFDL would guide me to saying, well, it's only going to be grounds for termination if there's a violation, a breach of something that is both essential and reasonable. And that seems to me to be a good way to balance it. Thanks. Ben? Yeah, Jeff, I think this gets to your opportunism point you made earlier. Um, you know, I think, I think the system standards it's a hard one because by necessity, you do want to keep those confidential and not disclose those before somebody is actually in the system. Um, but if you're a franchisor that's out there, you know, I mean, most of them, they take their brand standards and they go through and audit the restaurant and they check off boxes. And if you just miss one, you're not going to get that default notice. It has to be a significant number of problems in most cases. So the opportunistic franchisor, they might find the one and say, okay, we got you, you're out. And that that's where the problems arise. But I don't think there's a way you can not have the system standard be something that gets enforced uh, because that's that goes to the consistency and uniformity that is the key to the franchise system as a whole. Good point. Bethany? Yeah, I think you need the operations manual approach because you can't, you know, over time, if you have a 10 year, 15 year, even a five year franchise agreement, things are going to change, needs are going to change, and you have to be able to hold. Uh, franchisees to those standards. And I don't think you can put everything in the contract and renegotiate a modification every time, you know, the pizza sauce changes or whatever it is. But I agree with Ben. And, and I, you know, in my experience, courts and arbitrators look at materiality. And, you know, sometimes you will have franchisees claiming that they were terminated for some small transgression. But if you actually look at the entire record, you would see that there were, um, very there were there were other things going on and you know i think carts and courts and arbitrators are uh smart enough to figure that out well you and ben raise a, a good point um we'll go around the horn on this on materiality um i've seen too many franchise agreements that themselves define materiality so they'll say if uh if there's some injury to uh, reputation or something not very clear, that that will be in, considered material and grounds for an immediate termination. And those provisions have expanded and expanded and expanded in size over the last 10 years. So everything is declared to be material and an immediate termination. Now, putting aside, I know Mark is going to point out the Wisconsin Act. But putting aside the Wisconsin Act, isn't there a problem with a franchisee imposing its view of materiality when the law is that it has to be a material breach? In other words, is that default rule of the common law that it has to be material? Is that something franchisees and franchisors can waive through agreement and franchisees unknowingly do. Go ahead, Bethany. Oh, I was going to say, I haven't seen that, um, you know, and maybe it is because I represent franchisors, but I, I haven't seen that much overreaching in saying that these things that anybody would agree to or mean, you know, are, are very small transgressions are now um, material and you have no opportunity to cure. In most situations that I've seen, there may be a frustration level when a franchisee is not following the rules. But usually if it's not a material breach, they, they do have an opportunity to, uh, to cure and you know, some sort of notice period. And it wouldn't be an uh, immediate uh, termination for something that isn't material. But maybe other people have had different experiences. Yeah, I, I think mine's a bit different. Ben? Yeah, I mean, the, the, I think the example you gave, Jeff, I, I think it was the example you gave of the situation where it's some act that's going to 
going to harm the brand. Right. Um, and that's a material uh, default that is going to be subject to immediate termination. I mean, yes, I think the agreement should be able to define that as something that's material. The devil's in the details. Was it something that harmed the brand? Uh, right. That's the question I always ask my clients. It's like, okay, you're mad at this franchisee for doing this. And yes, you can immediately terminate them. But if they sue you, is it really something that damaged your brand? Because that's what we're going to litigate. And somebody's going to look at this. And even though you've taken materiality out of the ball game, right. they're going to bring it right back in because they're going to look at what whether what happened was actually justification for that termination. Thanks. Mark? I think that's right. In, in putting aside all statutes, you know, remember that the, the the common law does define materiality for us, and it's you know, granted, it's not going to be as precise as we might like, but it does. It, it, there is a lens there that you gotta you gotta look through, and it strikes me that it's kind of like the old joke about you know, if you call a, a if you call a tail a leg, how many legs does a dog have? And it's, it's still four. Doesn't matter what you call it in the agreement. Right. You know, you're gonna have to you're gonna have to meet that legal standard regardless. Alan? Yeah, I haven't seen sort of the apocalyptic uh, situation uh, that you might be positing, uh, Jeff. Uh, and I think franchisors are more careful about that, as Bethany and, and Ben point out. Um, also, because most franchisors don't want to do things that might cause a lot of consternation in the system. And, and as I tell franchisor clients, you know, one thing you don't want to do is lose. I said, you know, you might not enforce five times, but you don't want to lose one um, because that has the implications we all know about. And I'm not talking about things like race due to Cotter or collateral estoppel. Um, uh, the other thing is I'll answer a question you asked, Jeff, which was, can the parties agree to, to change the common law definitions? I mean, the answer is, I think it's not a good idea, but I don't know why they could not agree on that. Okay. I, I, that brings up a sort of a theoretical battle be, when law and economics started as, as to whether there are default rules. And most free market guys said you want to be able to waive it. You want to be able to work around what that is. And you have your cosy and trading, et cetera. But um, I, I, I don't know. Maybe it's just my luck of the draw. But the last two or three agreements that I'm involved in disputes, I, I've seen that immediate termination uh, without opportunity to, for cure, and it's gotten worse and worse over time. So I'm going to go back and look. If the four of you guys haven't seen it that much, maybe it's just my bad luck of the draw on these. Um, let's go to issue 10. Why are pr promos, maximum pricing and BOGOs and coupons, so controversial? in franchising? It's a very broad question. Alan, I see you thinking. I can't tell it. I'm thinking because I, I, I'm not sure if the, if, if the premise is, is something that I would have thought, that they're so controversial. In other words, certainly I think that lots of things like that were more, were more controversial when the antitrust laws were more restrictive in terms of what the franchisor could demand, especially in pricing situations. And then it was a little confusing about, you know, cooperative advertising and who could do what. And, 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 and that. I think that the law is, is much clearer now in the sense that the rule of reason controls everything. And there's a lot of franchisor, you know, freedom to do what they want. And, you know, obviously some franchisees feel, I don't want to, I don't want to do all these promotions. I'm losing money. You know, I, I don't want to, you know, have to sell, you know, 32 pizzas for 12 cents, you know, and that sort of thing. But um, uh, I think that as time has gone on, certainly in the last 10, 12, 15 years, there's less controversy about that. And I've seen litigation, um, you know, there's certainly a handful of cases that go in the franchisees, uh, at least I think it's a denial of a motion to dismiss. There was, there was the dollar, I don't remember the exact uh, procedural posture of it, but the dollar menu case um, where I think the franchisee has cleared at least one hurdle. But what I see it more is um, rather than on the legal side is more of a, re a franchisee franchisor relationship side where the franchisees get very frustrated and they speak, you know, they're accused the franchisor of opportunism where the franchisor gets increased royalty for increased sales. But it's the franchisee who says, you know, I had to pay for all of the 
you know, the fixings uh, for that meal. And I, you know, I'm making no profit. I still have to pay my employees. So I see, I see it less in court and in arbitration than I do just in general um, bad relations between franchisors and franchisees. I, I think that's absolutely right because you get in the, in I've had situations in the food industry uh, where the franchisee feels whipsawed because it's got these obligations to buy often from uh, companies that are related to or owned by the franchisor. And it's got its questions about whether it's really getting best pricing or preferable pricing. And then it's got to sell on the, on, on the other side, it's got to sell at a huge discount. And uh, sometimes they quite reasonably feel that they're getting, uh, you know, they're getting it on both ends. And that's something that again, uh, uh, it's rarely addressed in litigation, but it really needs to be addressed in terms of the relationship and the way that those parties can do business and actually trust one another. That it is, you know, the franchisor can really make a, 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 a very persuasive business case that, look, it is in your interest to have these sales at these low prices. Uh, and the franchisor can uh, put its own skin in and prove that it's not being opportunistic by uh, sometimes by cutting the prices that they sell, uh, they sell the, the, uh, the inputs for. Exactly. Yeah, or maybe cover uh, some type of co-op advertising, some type of credit back. And go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, Mark, Mark hit the nail on the head. It's about transparency. Uh, if a franchisor is going to roll one of these things out, they've got to be transparent about how it plays out. I mean, if you roll out a buy one, get one, it should be based on a, a, a deal you're getting from your food supplier or a rebate that you're going to give back to the franchise system so that you're proving to them this is going to drive people to your restaurant and it gets back into your pocket because we've got a back end way of, of, of making you whole. Um, if, if you're not transparent about how the plan works on those things, you're absolutely right. The relationships can be bad because the franchisees are going to be claiming that, you know, you're making money off their backs. Well, what do you, do you think a covenant of good faith and fair dealing should govern in this kind of a case where you've got the franchisor telling the franchisee, you've got to sell this, this cheeseburger for a buck and for six months? Or do you... Yeah. If you're going to ask me about the covenant of good faith and fair dealing, my answer is always going to be no. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't think you don't think a covenant of good faith and fair dealing could, if applied properly, promote efficiency at the same time as it promotes equity? I have a hard time with good faith and reasonableness ever promoting efficiency because they're such amorphous standards. I'm a more of, they're subjective and I don't think subjectivity ever promotes efficiency. I'm more of objective standards. Those work for me better. I think those can promote efficiency. So good faith isn't something that, that works for me. If the agreement says that the franchisor can set the pricing, the franchisor can set the pricing. It goes back to the opportunism you talked about. It's incumbent upon the franchisor to do right by the franchisees in doing that so that they don't cut off their nose to spite their face. Well, how do they prove that? Do, do you think for a menu item or a BOGO that they, that they should, there should be a requirement that they uh, do a study, a legitimate study as to how this, how that uh, price, pricing is going to play out in the market or is a hunch okay? A I don't hunch think is cheaper, right? I don't think there should be a requirement, but if you're running a good business, I think you are going to want to look at that. I mean, if you're right, a hunch is a bad way to run a business. I, re requiring the franchisor to do it doesn't make sense um, because then who's 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 overseeing that? Um, but I think if if you're a smart business person, you are going to do your due diligence before you roll out something like that. Um, okay, Bethany, you already answered. I think I yeah I think I think every, it's all been said. Well done. Ben. All right. Next issue. Um, well, I, let me just add sort of, uh, so I think what we're saying, what uh, Alan, I, I don't think there's any antitrust implications to these kinds of things anymore, unless the franchisor is gonna be agreeing with another franchisor in that segment, in that industry. And so you're pretty much, even though you're gonna go through a rule of reason, you get it dismissed. So it's really what's left in the franchise agreement and whether, and the funny part is the old franchise agreements were concerned about antitrust liability. So they said, we, have, we don't want to touch pricing, but now they do. So you've got the legacy of the, uh, of the old uh, antitrust laws. I think there are still some state law quirks that you can trip over um, 
if, California. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> the, yeah. Alan, Alan was saying something. We have to. It can't be uniform uh, across every state. My state of Maryland, uh, my former state, is a perfect example, but it's not the only one. You know, apropos of the discussion we just had, the extent to which a franchisor can, you know, can decide it wants to institute a program, a promotion, so forth. There isn't, and it may be a misapplication, or it may be, as Ben might say, just it's the wrong place for this. But as a legal matter, I think where the franchisor has this sort of discretion and it's not spelled out in the contract precisely what the, the policy is, then the covenant of good faith and fair dealing can be used by a franchisee to challenge that. Maybe not, maybe franchisor, a good one, is going to come up with a business reason and the franchisee would lose. A franchisee will win in the rare case where the policy is so destructive of the franchisee's profits and ability to survive. Uh, Peter Wright case in the Second Circuit is a good example uh, where you've got a constructive termination. But the construct the number of constructive termination victories by franchisees, you can count on one hand. Good point. Um, so, Ben, let me ask you a question on the covenant of good faith and fair dealing. You would have that view about any contract, whether it's a franchise contract or not. Your view is that, and I'm not trying to put words in your mouth. You're not going to let me. Um, a, a, covenant of good faith, a covenant of good faith and fair dealing is not something that really belongs to uh, what could be recognized as a contract, legitimate contractual principle. I mean, I think if there's situations that a contract doesn't address, I mean, that's kind of the UCC concept, right? If the contract doesn't right. address the situation, that's when the covenant steps in and fills that void. The parties are supposed to do each other in good faith. I mean, that, you know, I I, I have a mortgage on my house. If, if something's not covered in my mortgage, I sure want the, the lender to act towards me in good faith rather than just kicking me out. But, um, you know, I think I think that's that's one of the reasons, you know, the franchise agreements get really long is that franchisors are trying to define all of the things that can and can't be done. So there's nothing left to chance so that you don't get into this amorphous area of, well, let's just put good faith on top of it and we'll figure out how it plays out. Let, let me follow up with one more question and we'll go around. Why are franchise, in my view, franchise agreements are very one-sided. Um, uh, do you think that is a, um, wh why do you think that is? And then we'll go around. And, why, and do I, why do I think you think they're one-sided? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you, you would take the view that they're not one-sided, I guess. I mean, I mean, I think, you know, it's a licensed relationship. The licensor needs to have the control. Uh, and so they draft the agreement to protect their interests. Uh, so in that sense, I guess, if you want to call it one sided, I go go back to when Alan said earlier about pejorative terms. But um, I mean, it, it is the franchisor's agreement. No question. Right. Bethany. Yeah, I, I agree with Ben once again, that it's the franchisor has the intellectual property, has the system it can and should be able to define on what terms it offers that system, you know, within the bounds of the law. So it, it will draft it in how it wants it drafted. And it is a, an agreement that's a standard for the most part template agreement. And, it, you know, I, I don't think, I think it would defy business logic to say that it should be one-sided in the other direction. Correct. We, we've had any number of situations where we, uh, get hired either uh, my partner Joe Good or I get hired to uh, walk through an FDD and in an agreement with a prospective franchisee. And I think it's happened, I don't know, eight, nine, ten times. Uh, people will actually do that kind of proactive thing. And when we walk them through, uh, I think zero out of those ten have actually gone forward and bought the franchise. Wow. So that, uh, that kind of tells you what happens when you sit down and actually it isn't just a sales team explaining it. It's uh, it's somebody who's uh, kind of on, on their side uh, explaining it to them. Alan? Well, you can you have the wonderful doctrine of unconscionability, which is a, a dead letter almost. But, you know, what I think is that franchise agreements uh, in 1975, if you will, were considerably more even-handed and uh, i don't blame a franchisor for doing what's legally uh, allowable to protect its you know its system 
Um, but I think that the main problem, because I'm an old antitrust lawyer and a liberal, is are the four basic Supreme Court decisions that eviscerated, you know, that that favored in interbrand competition over intrabrand competition, that allowed franchisors to dictate prices, that allowed them to dictate uh, territories, that allowed them to dictate resale, excuse me, uh, channels, and allowed them uh, to to engage in tying, which I think is the worst antitrust violation because it, it, it hits two markets. Uh, you know, so, but that's what the U.S. Supreme Court decided. So, you know, as I told people, you know, if you voted for Nixon instead of Humphrey, you got what you expected. And then a couple of other presidents, that's fine, you know, but I think that that created a very substantial imbalance in a situation that was pro-franchisor, but still reasonably balanced in terms of franchisee, uh, I'll say basic freedom. That, that, that's an interesting point. And, and I think, the, I mean, that's a good point. The antitrust decisions may have created some of that uh, one-sidedness. I, let me ask Ben something. Ben, do you think the franchise agreements, general franchise agreements, uh, a, a generalization. Do you think they're the result of market forces, or do you think that uh, the re the result of anything else? Or would you say market forces have created those? I, I think that we've created those, Jeff. I think the that, and, and if you want to call litigation a market force, sure. I think I think litigation over franchise agreements and disputes have created the franchise agreements we have today. Good answer, Bethany. What do you think? Are franchise agreements free, the result of free market forces? I think it's a mix. I do think that franchisors, when there something happens in litigation, either that they were involved in or that they've seen uh, other franchisors struggle with, do go ahead and try to plug the hole and stop that risk. They don't want to be the next target. So, um, you know, that's uh, that does happen. And franchisees can say no. There are lots and lots and lots of franchisors around. So the free market is, you know, I know you said, Jeff, that uh, you view the franchise agreements as one sided, but there are franchisees who want to buy them and they have disclosure documents. And I that's how the free market works. I've always Mark? asked people who come in for those FTD reviews. Why is it that you don't want to open, you know, Pete's sub shop? Uh, why do you want a franchise? And uh, and there's, you know, that that that's a very very important question. And on the on the contracts, the, the contracts come about because of this evolving process that you said of it's kind of a, a, a iterative process between the court and the uh, and the and the company. And it reminds me a lot of what happens in insurance coverage, because those are also generally standard form contracts. The courts will rule, well, the pollution exclusion means this or doesn't mean this. And then you see another variety. And mm -hmm. and so that, you know, just markets are there, but markets are created by law. Alan? To Bethany's point, you know, sometimes people will say to me, why is this in this contract? Why is it in the contract? And I'll say because the franchisor a few years ago lost some case and the lawyers were asked to plug the hole. And that's that's what they should do. Um, but, you know, I think a lot of people, we don't, most franchisees don't look at 10 different franchises and so forth. They have their own, you know, information. They get it from a lot of other people. And they look, look, a lot of the big franchise systems get a lot of people because people say, oh, wow, Subway's got 20,000, 30,000, whatever franchise. It must be a good idea. Uh, you know, uh, success breeds success. Right. Hey, 50 million I, I, Elvis fans can't be wrong. <laughs> I, I, I think I'd... Uh, I'm a big fan of the free market. It may not seem like it, but I, I think there were too many market failures here, and the FDD is is uh, one of them, as as I pointed out uh, earlier. I I think franchisees are have cognitive significant cognitive difficulties. There's no ability to compare. I think comparing one franchisee deal to another, and how you can possibly evaluate a deal 
without giving the prospective franchisee profit numbers when they're in your uh you have an, a franchisors have an ability to do it it seems to me if you start to move on those three you may get some differences in how the franchise agreement is is going to look um but I, I i answering my own question i would i would say it's really not a free market in in the franchise world and i wouldn't say that because a contract is a contract of adhesion therefore it's not a result of a free market because you can certainly have but i th i think in the franchise world uh it is um i think we're coming close to the end um i'll ask uh one more question let me ask this question why is it that almost all courts agree with franchisors that the only goodwill developed in a franchise business belongs to the franchisor, but not the franchisee. Why is that? Now, you, Ben, I know you wouldn't agree with the premise, but uh, I'll go to Bethany first. Well, it is, you know, one of the reasons, um, and I think it came up earlier, why do franchisees want to be a franchise rather than Pete's sandwiches or whatever uh, Mark's uh, example was, is that it is that that brand name, that recognition, that system. And I don't know how you separate. I mean, that certainly is the bulk of it. You know, could there be around the edges, you know, the the five customers who come in every day for lunch and, you know, you know, the very friendly person behind the counter who's probably somebody different next week. Um, you know, how you, how, certainly I, I, I would see that the vast majority of any goodwill would have to be the franchisors in the, in the system. I, you know, could a franchisee argue that they should have a piece of the pie? It's an interesting question. And I know that there's a Franchise Law Journal article, I believe, that Nicole <laughs> Nicklick uh, wrote about that. Great recall. Mark, what do you think? That the I, you written? know, I, I, would, I would trace it back to the, the you know, mostly to the, 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 the concepts that Bethany identified, you know, specifically the trademark and the intellectual property and the idea that you have a turnkey operation here. But I would note that uh, I'm involved in a case right now where the the franchisees, the stores, are saying, "Well, with our creative, local advertising and our, you know, we're actually driving uh, the way that this business develops and has developed over the years, and uh, and you should pay us uh, under an unjust enrichment theory for uh, the value uh, that we have added to this franchise system over the years." And uh, we'll see how that fares, uh, obviously. But uh, but you know, it, it, it is possible, I guess, to take that uh, all and uh, stand it on its head. And, uh, Although the franchise agreements usually have the uh, the innovation clause yes, that you know anything exactly. anything mm -hmm. that, that you do that helps right. us is ours. So yeah, exactly. yeah. Well, you know that that's a problem. Um, you know, Alan, what's mine is yes, mine, sir. and what yours is mine. I see this as a dichotomy in a way because. For many years, I did a lot of injunction cases for terminated franchisees. And when you get a preliminary injunction, one of the things you argue, and, and the court will agree if it grants it, is irreparable harm because it's a loss of not just money, it's goodwill and so forth. So the court implicitly or explicitly finds a franchisee has goodwill. But that's different in another way when you have somebody who is, who is at the end of their term, you've got a post-term non-compete. Implicit in that is there's really not goodwill left because they're not even allowed to compete for a year or two with regard to the same people they've been dealing with. So if somebody's terminated after five years of a 10 year contract, there's an argument that there's goodwill there, maybe not at the end of the contract. Okay. That's, that's interesting the way Alan put that. I mean, I, I, I've seen the argument made to me before where it's the end of the term and the non-compete it's it's why are you enforcing this if i don't have any goodwill in this business what what reason do you need the non-compete you know and and so that i've seen that argument i haven't seen it prevail but i've seen the argument right. 
Um, I, the, the one other thing I, I note, and and I don't want to go the wrong direction on this because I do represent franchisors, is I think it's a harder question about goodwill when you're talking about some of the franchise concepts we see today that are kind of personal services where the, the franchisees develop relationships with customers because they're providing services directly to the customer, not serving a hamburger, not delivering a pizza, but cutting their grass or, you know, um, giving them a massage. I mean, those are things that where you develop a relationship where there's a question in my mind, if I'm a franchisee attorney, who does have that goodwill? I mean, you say in the contract that customer's yours, you say that, you know, that, that's how that works, but you wouldn't have that relationship if it weren't for the seven years that I've worked with that client. So I, I those are the cases that are hard for me to litigate as a franchisor because I'm relying on a piece of language in a contract that says the customers are ours when we don't even know who the customers are. Yeah. And, uh, all great points. I, I think Alan uh, talking about the uh, the uh, post term cases. That's that's that is where it arises uh, frequently, and most courts don't even think twice about it. The goodwill automatically belongs to the franchise, or because of the trademark. And really, uh, logically, that doesn't take you to the end to the points that we've been talking about. Let me just follow this up, and then we'll, we'll be finished. In California, as everybody knows, uh, most times uh, trying to enforce a covenant, post-term covenant not to compete is, is not going to be successful. And franchisors operate successfully. I, don't, I haven't seen any articles where franchisors have had problems either selling or operating in California. So why is when franchisors make the argument that it's absolutely necessary to have a post-term covenant, how can they make that argument when right at the other side of the country, you've got the, one of the biggest states operating franchising with no problems, but no ability to enforce a covenant not to compete? Ben? I, you know, if you've got a good enough concept um, and you've got, the kind of know-how and, you know, if you provide proprietary recipes or ingredients, then the non-compete becomes less important. And so the, I think the, the brands that are successful in California are probably the ones that have different ways of making sure their franchisees want to stay in the system as opposed to going off on their own. Bethany? Well, I, don't, I keep an eye on California because, you know, there are courts starting to look at, you know, is this a business, is this like business or is this like employment? And right. can we um, enforce post uh, post term non-competes in California? So we'll see. Yeah, I think I think there are some courts that are nibbling at it. Um, Mark, every time you hear somebody say the sky is falling, uh, you know, it almost never does. <laughs> so. You know, there's my answer for you. I mean, it's a, you hear the predictions of the prophets of doom and they don't come true. And I think that that, that gives you a, a dose of reality that tells you, look, you the the covenants, the post term covenants are not, in fact, necessary. Alan, I asked this question a few years ago to uh, a former franchise law journal editor uh, uh, who's a franchise or lawyer, uh, a great one. And I said, well, how do you argue that point? And he said, you know, I, I just look at the judge and I say, your honor, they're all lunatics in California. <laughs> that's, that's probably as, uh, as well as any other. Well, I'm going to really thank everybody. I had a great time. Uh, personal thank you to everybody, Bethany, Ben, Mark, and Alan. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks Bye, a lot, everyone. everyone.